Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning and welcome to all. Those of you who are here in the sanctuary this morning and all those of you who are at home uh, with us, viewing online on this, the Lord's Day. The Lord be with you. And a grateful welcome if you're here as a regular or first time guest. We're always reminded that we are all part of one great family of God as we come together to worship God this day in spirit and in truth. So thank you for being with us. Uh, our, our hope and aim as a congregation is to continue to grow, uh, not hold this good news to ourselves, but to share it with all and to uh, increase um, those who follow Jesus. So good to have everyone with us today. A few announcements as we begin. Uh, first, a thank you to Carrie Dietz, our guest organist, who will be leading us in worship. A reminder that today is the first Sunday of the month, which means that following our morning message in response to the good news, we'll be sharing in Holy Communion. Uh, if you're at home and forgot that it's the first Sunday of the month, you have time to Go grab a piece of bread and some orange juice. And uh, if you're here in the sanctuary and forgot, if you'd like to take a moment, uh, you can go to the back of the center aisle of the sanctuary here and pick up your communion elements. This morning, the United Methodist Women are beginning their neighborhood house giving tree outreach uh, from this morning, the no November the 7th through December the 5th. You're invited to visit their giving tree. It's located just outside uh, the door here of the sanctuary up front in the hallway uh, where you can pick up your donation envelope. We're looking at gift cards this year because of the COVID. We don't want a lot of people out shopping. So you can pick up your donation envelope from the tree. Uh, this will sponsor 20 children from the neighborhood house, uh, their annual Christmas gift card drive. So there is more information in your weekly messenger. A reminder to sign up for our Connection Advent study. Uh, this study is offered on Monday mornings, Tuesday and Wednesday evenings. The Wednesday evening Connection group I begin, begin, starts this week, uh, this coming Wednesday. So you'll want to sign up as soon as possible. You can go to our St. Paul's website. How many of you have been to our St. Paul's website? Good, good, wow, wonderful. Uh, you can sign up there or speak to one of our three leaders. That's uh, Lynn, Fran, and Chet there. So Fran's right here too. She's in the red. I don't know if Chet's here today. I think he may be visiting with his grandchildren. A reminder also that our International Women's Club, who meet here on Wednesday and Thursday mornings, is having their annual dessert festival. So I'm excited. Uh, I will be here. Uh, that's this, this Wednesday, November the 10th, from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m., desserts from around the world. Uh, you can also go on uh, the Weekly Messenger, and there's a website you can place your orders in advance. But I hope to taste something from each part of the world that they're represented. That's my goal. This morning is the first Sunday of our annual stewardship campaign. Uh, this year's campaign is entitled, Leaving a Legacy of Enough. Over the next three Sundays, Pastor Finch and I will be preaching on the myth of scarcity, the truth of God's sufficiency, and our Christian vocation of leaving to the next generation a legacy of enough, uh, for which some of us have a lot to make up for. So I hope you'll be here for all three Sundays. On Sunday, November the 21st, during our worship service, all friends and members of the congregation will be invited to make a financial commitment to the life and ministries of our church for the coming year, uh, 2022. Uh, this coming week, you'll be receiving a stewardship letter in the mail, along with your estimate of giving card. And if you have any questions, please speak with me or with Tom Gorman, our financial secretary. Finally, uh, I think Pastor Finch has some explaining to do uh, today with the sermon title that's been up out front on our sign all week. Did any of you see it? Oh, yes, look, see this, David. And what does it say? 
money always wins. So I think he has some explaining to do today. <laughs> Any other announcements we should share? Uh, we won't be having a time of prayer today, but it is good uh, to see Elaine and Ruth with us this morning. John, you survived your air flight. John, are you awake? Yes, okay. Uh, so it's good to have everyone with us. Let us now turn to, uh, together to the worship of God as we listen to our morning prelude. If you are able, please rise now for our morning call to worship. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Let us now worship the Lord as we lift our voices in song on this communion Sunday, gather us in.
Let us pray. Generous God, in abundance, you give us all things. Help us to hold lightly the fading things of this world and to hold tightly to the lasting things of your kingdom so that what we are and do and say may be our gifts to you and to one another. Through Christ our Lord who beckons us to seek the things above, where he lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, we pray this day. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. And now let us quiet and still our hearts even as we pray together, listening to the ministry of music. Good morning. Please join me in the prayer of the day. Almighty God, judge us all. You have placed in our hands the wealth we call our own. Through your spirit, give us wisdom that our possessions may not be a curse, but a means of blessing in our lives. Through Christ, our Lord, we pray, amen and also the prayer of illumination. O Lord, open our ears that we may hear what your spirit is saying to the church this day. 
Amen. The Gospel reading today is Luke chapter 12. Please rise as you're able. This is verses 13 through 21, the parable of the rich fool. Someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, friend, who set me to be a judge or arbiter over you? And he said to them, take care, be on your guard against all kinds of greed for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly. And he thought to himself, what should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich towards God. This is the word of the Lord. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it. The world and those who live in it. For he has founded it on the seas and established it on the rivers. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it. And uh, we are given the wonderful privilege uh, as followers of the Lord to be stewards of that great gift. Isn't that wonderful? You. Uh, you sort of feel the energy of life and of uh, uh, privilege when you think of yourself as a steward of the great God who has made this world and everything that's in it. And somehow or another gives us the marvelous privilege of being stewards of that gift. Now the money, now, now the title, the money always wins. Okay, let me see if I can deal with that in a way that makes sense. It really is not my line. I think it comes out of its kinship though with the text, if you will uh, allow me to make the association. And um, the line comes from the lips of actually one of the world's most richest individuals back in the 70s, and I read it in the newspaper, when he was being cautioned about something he wanted to do that conflicted with uh, the church, the church of which he was not a member, but uh, actually preparing to join because of an upcoming marriage. He was told in his conversation with his friend that there's a problem here. There's a problem here with your plan. And uh, he said, what is the problem? He said, well, the problem is, my man, you are divorced. And the church you are now proposing to enter by marriage does not uh, recognize divorce. And you've got a problem here. And the uh, gentleman who was the owner of much of the world's goods said to him, let me tell you something about our conversation. 
I uh, have discovered that when it comes to a contest between religion and money, money always wins. Now, I copied that. There was a kind of a, a cynicism in that. But the truth of the matter is, uh, you can make enough of what you want the world to be if you have the goods of the world. And if you define success or failure in those terms, you can take what you have and make yourself a winner. But if you read this psalm correctly, the earth is the Lord's, it's not yours, and the fullness thereof and all that dwell therein, the major way of relating to the life that you have been given to live is to make sure that you are properly using as a steward the gift that God has given you of life. I uh, read it the other day uh, in a line that's being quoted somewhere in an advertisement. I just heard it on television without actually seeing who was saying it. And that is this, I think it's from the Moulin Rouge, the film. The greatest thing you'll ever learn is just to love and be loved in return and make my mark on earth. The greatest thing you'll ever learn is just to love and be loved in return and make your mark on earth. And it seems to me that somehow or another, without really commenting on his position on money one way or the other, because the Lord knew that money belongs to God, as well as to the stewards who use it in order to do God's will, the greatest thing that we can do is to find a way to uh, engage in relationships with family and friends and business associates and the people of this world in a way that makes love the central principle of our life together, to love and be loved in return and make your mark on earth. And I think that's generally thing. what I was thinking when I thought maybe that'd be a good title, Money Always Wins, because in a way it does. Maybe it's supposed to. Maybe it, God understands that this is a medium of exchange that does not have to poison us and ruin us. Uh, the Bible, as a matter of fact, doesn't say money is evil. It says the love of money is the root of all evil. It's given us as stewards to use and to use wisely so that we can do the will of God on this earth, so that we can help people find and discover that the greatest thing they'll ever learn is to love and be loved in return and make their mark on earth. And when David gave me the responsibility of preaching this first sermon, as we open now the fall uh, emphasis on stewardship, I was thinking, wow, what a privilege it is just to say that again and to reassure it. I've done it, Sissy, this is 64 years now. <laughs> I'm doing something I never thought I'd do when I uh, said yes to ministry 64 years ago, and that's, to, and that's to talk about raising money. I didn't think that's what ministry was all about. And I found that what you're doing every year in this community of faith that believes that the greatest uh, thing that we'll ever learn is just to love and be loved in return and make our mark on earth is first of all to say exactly how do we plan to do that? What are we going to say to family and friends and the world we live in that makes that a central theme of life and to live that in a way that people say yes, to what is being said to them. And we write that down in figures. We put that in a budget. We say, okay, this is how we're going to do that. And uh, here's what it's going to cost us. And then we go out to the folk that are part of the confessing community and say, okay, uh, here's our challenge for the next year. But we do have to have 
money in order to do this. We can't just hope that this is going to happen. We have to make sure it is going to happen. And our response to that is to give sacrificially ourselves to make sure that what we sense and, and what we believe about ourselves and in terms of the life God has given us to live can be accomplished by the contribution that we make. Now, I have uh, done that nearly 64 years. I was counting it this morning. Uh, I can't believe I even did that uh, because I didn't think that's what I was going to be doing in ministry. I didn't think that's what it was about. I thought of stewardship in a different way. And I must tell you, uh, I have planned and done the work that I believe was my responsibility as a Christian minister in the congregations to which I was appointed every year that way. And here is something I must confess. I have never, ever been successful. I've never reached the goal. I've done um, seven major uh, money campaigns in the churches I've served, two in the annual conferences where I worked in the leadership of the conference. And in all of those efforts, except one, I never reached the goal that was set forth as what was needed in order to do the ministry of God, to make people understand how life is the greatest thing they'll ever learn is to be loved and to be loved in return and to make their mark on earth. And then I read this, and that helped me to understand to some degree, what Jesus is saying here is that you don't measure this in terms of success, but in terms of achievement. You don't have to be 100% successful in what you think you ought to be doing as a congregation or as an individual in order to set forth in concrete terms your plans and your hopes and your dreams and what you believe you ought to be doing. But to do everything possible to make sure you're reaching toward that goal. And if you come only in, 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 in at the end with 90% of what you asked for, well, you've achieved something that you wouldn't have done if you hadn't have tried. So I think the lesson in that is to set sights high and to believe that um, this uh, God we serve is the giver. Earth is the Lord's. It's the Lord's. The money you're sitting on is not yours. I'm, 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 I'm saying this rhetorically as a preacher here, so I'm not scolding you. You can do whatever you want with your money. <laughs> Except to say, the Bible says it ain't yours. You are the stewards of it. And you are great stewards of it when you achieve great things and are successful, but it still belongs to God. And the question is, how do we take, how do we marshal the energies of our life in order to make sure that what Jesus is teaching in this lesson here about people who believe that success is having the money, it's no, it's using uh, the money. It's finding a way to get involved in its, um, its, its witness as a way to achieve the purposes of God. One of the things that's always uh, uh, sort of intrigued me about uh, this text is that it came uh, into Luke's understanding or to Luke's memory of the gospel. Um, from a voice that called out to God from the crowd, it called out to Jesus from the crowd. Master, make my brother divide the inheritance with me. Why should you have to do that? If you're entitled to it, then it's yours. It's yours to use. It's yours to, um, to uh, be a steward of. Why should the Lord have to make your brother um, give you what is yours. And Jesus was saying, 
Even, even the thought that dependence upon what is not being given you uh, and that you don't have is a matter of justice. Take heed and be careful that your life doesn't be consumed by assuming that if you have the material wealth of this world, you will be what the master who has given its, its measure to every person uh, requires of you. The greatest thing you'll ever learn is just to love and be loved in return and to make your mark on earth. I've discovered in, uh, in these years, I've had the privilege of being uh, in ministry that money sometimes goes into hiding. Uh, it, it doesn't always behave the way you want it to. And even though you come close, <clears throat> Even though you come close, even though you come very close, even though the, the, the aims you have are noble, you can justify the budget you put before the people. You can say this is something we've got to do. We exist for this purpose in the world and we must be able to do this as a congregation uh, or as individuals in order to be faithful to um, the God who has called us to ministry. Sometimes the resources you need in order to make that happen just don't materialize. I remember going into the life of one of the large churches over in, in uh, Jersey when I left the cabinet and I was told that story. They were convinced that they had to take a historic building that was uh, locked into uh, the dead ends of the center of the town so that their was difficulty in getting people to come there, couldn't park, couldn't find a place to get in. And one of the very wealthy uh, person, maybe the most wealthy person in the congregation said, listen, I'll help you fix that. I'll give you 10 acres of land south of here. I'll give you $100,000 to begin with. And we'll just move this whole operation down to where people can find it more easily accessible and we'll make this church grow and it will be uh, a city set on the hill. And so the congregation gathered and heard all of the reasons for doing it and then took a vote. You know, your congregation gets to vote in the end. Are you in agreement with this or not? Will you support it? And they did by a very narrow margin support it large numbers, but by a very narrow margin. Okay, that was a, uh, that was success. And when you measured the, uh, when you, the proposal in terms of whether or not the church believed it ought to do it by a narrow margin, they said yes. Then they had to go out and raise the money. And guess what? Money went into hiding. And the people who said, <laughs> We need to do this in order to secure our future, in order to be faithful witnesses to the gospel we preach. Money went into hiding and the people who didn't want that to happen were the ones who had the most and it didn't happen. And the gentleman who was so generous in offering uh, the gift of land and and large sums of money to get the project started was upset and scolded the folk who uh, were not able to make it happen because the plan had to be abandoned. And I remember the gentleman who ran the campaign, very fine, retired CEO of one of Wall Street's great, uh, uh, corporations and a member of that church in retirement said the, the gentleman accosted him in the aisle of one of the stores there on the streets of that city and angrily said to him, you have let me down. And he said, sir, we tried to do everything. We just couldn't raise the money. 
And the man's response was, I told you, I wouldn't let you down. And turned on his heels and walked away. As if to say, all you had to do was to trust me to give you what was needed in order to do what the church itself, by the narrowest of margins, said it would not support with the gift of its money. Well, it didn't work for them in the way they wanted to, but the church did change its approach to its ministry. It enlarged its facility in a different way. It stands there today, even yet, in the midst of a great city, a beacon to hope for God, but having lost the battle to money when it wanted to put itself into um, a, a place where it felt it would be of greater influence and more successful. What Jesus is saying in this passage is, um, listen to the one who has called you to share in the gift that is the gift of the earth and its resources. And forget the way in which money wants to influence uh, the outcome of whether or not, in your judgment, it's going to be successful. Just do what he is calling you to do, for the greatest thing you'll ever learn is just to love and be loved in return and make your mark on earth. I think that's a wonderful way to begin this. Uh, Dave is going to tell us how to do this now the next two, two weeks. I get, to, uh, I get to make the opening statement and uh, we'll see whether or not he's successful. <laughs> and we'll see whether or not enough of the energy of God flows through. I've always been impressed with the generosity of this congregation. You are wonderful stewards, I must tell you. Now, um, I've been here 10 years. You know, that's longer than any, any other place where I have served, believe it or not. Uh, you, you're so generous in your ability to tolerate an old preacher. 10 years I've been here, I thought, wow, what a privilege it is to be associated with uh, the St. Paul United Methodist Church in, in Wilmington, Delaware. And I have, I have just seen over the years where I've been here as a hired hand the generosity of the people of this church. And I, I'm impressed, really, by the way in which you have used the resources. And while money always wins in the ways in which it's appointed by God to win, it is not the last word in our lives as we gather from Sunday to Sunday and from week to week, verbally, by, by digital, uh, uh, what do you call it, David? I'm looking for a word. Yes, by a vir virtual worship, by listening to us while you're at home and can't get out or using uh, the magic of digital a communication to visit and take part in the life of the congregation and to uh, give thanks to God that in a time of really great challenge and need in the social order and in our life together, we are given the privilege of, again, looking at who we are and what we want to be and of asking the question, what is this going to cost? And finding a way to generate the funds that take the vision of ministry, which grows out of our understanding of our life together and make it a gift to this world in which we live. Thanks be to God.
Thanks be to God for your generosity. Thanks be to God for his generosity, for this service today and for the days that roll on before us that give us a chance once more to say yes to the challenge of ministry in this world in which we live. Amen. Amen. Amen, Amen again. Amen. Are we supposed to sing, Pastor? No, we're going to have communion. And let us now pray together the great thanksgiving. Lift up your hearts and give thanks to God. Blessed are you, O God, who with your word and Holy Spirit created all things and called them good. In Jesus Christ, your word became flesh and dwelt among us. And through his life, suffering and death, and resurrection, you took upon yourself our sin and death and destroyed their power forever. You raised from the dead this same Jesus, who now reigns with you in glory, and poured out upon us your Holy Spirit, making us the people of your new covenant. On the night before meeting with death, Jesus took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on this gift of bread and wine that we may know the presence of the living Christ and be renewed as the body of Christ in the world, redeemed by Christ's life and blood. Until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at your table in glory forever, through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, our gracious and merciful Lord, now and forever. Amen. I'd like to break the bread. Just break the bread. The body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Friends, I'd like to invite you now to take your cup and wafer. We'll commune together. Uh, first, we'll share in the breaking of the bread. The body of Christ broken for you. Take and eat.
the blood of Christ shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins, take and drink. Loving God, we thank you that you have fed us through this sacrament, united us with Christ, and given us a foretaste of the heavenly banquet in your eternal realm. Send us out now by the power of your spirit to live and work to your praise and your glory for the sake of Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our closing hymn, if you'll please rise, is the familiar hymn, I Surrender All.